there are four factors of a real estate crash. And I will even admit that we may see most, if not all of these, in the very, very near future. And some may be happening right now. Dion has gone out and collected the four factors. He's going to run through them with us. And uh, we're going to talk about just how nasty these will impact the real estate market. Dion, the floor is yours. And, you know, just so those people who can will attack me in the comments, there are more than four, but these are the four that I see <laughs> causing a real estate crash, where the real estate crash is going to be, and uh, how you can benefit from it. The first thing to, to define what it takes to make a real estate crash is for supply and demand to shift, right? We need massive demand um, to go away, which would, what, uh, high interest rates, high prices, demand can go away, but we would need an oversupply. And the oversupply could come from forced sellers. So these four things can lead to forced sellers. I don't see the thing that's going to make demand going away, to go away. Even if interest rates went to 1,000%, there are cash buyers. There's 1031 exchanges, right? There's all these ways to redeploy capital. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, the oversupply, right? If supply were to go up and... Uh, you guys have seen the chart in the last 10 years, how many homes were built versus the decade before the decade. We had 26 million, 27 million, then five point something million in the last 10 years. 5.6, yeah. But that's in residential. What have we seen in commercial, in the warehouse? Is there a town where you don't see what looks like Amazon terminals popping up? Mm -hmm. So what do you guys see going on with the supply? Matt, go ahead. Um, so supply, I think from a residential perspective, um, you know, you're looking at Pulte Homes. Pulte Homes is a great idea. They got 2 billion bucks on the balance sheet. And so there's, when they sell their houses, they give financing at 5.75. Yep. That's the way to keep people buying. That's why your people are buying brand new Pulte Homes is because they're getting debt at 575. Getting a new house with a warranty and product and all done, and I don't have to touch it for 10 years. And so it uh further affirms the point that it's all about <clears throat> it's all about um the dollar, you know, the rate uh, and the cost payment. 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 And so the challenge that you have is that as that changes or as they are not able to subsidize the purchasing of those assets, that's gonna be what slows them down or costs continuing to increase. Um, I'm really not overly concerned about it on the residential side because we will get worse unemployment than where we are now. When we do get that worse unemployment, people aren't going to be able to pay. However, they also are going to, most people will look at it and go, we have to keep our house. It's not, we need to, or want to, we have to, because renting is more expensive than our house payment. Renting is going to cost us more. So that's, I think that, that that's there's the not one. supply coming. Yeah. I don't think yeah, there's supply. The, I don't think what, there's big supply coming. No, Matt, Matt nailed it. A lot of people are living in recency bias with the Great Recession. And again, sure. I invested through it. So I say this with, with certainty. People were looking at their adjusted payment and going, this is effing nuts. Yeah. I can move down the street to a better this or that for less money. It made financial sense. You are an idiot if you pay that higher rate. Correct. Today, people are going to be like my mom in, in the early 80s who was sitting around a kitchen table with all these different color envelopes because we couldn't pay our bills. And she was distraught saying, I have to find a way to save this house and not paying other things. Right. Because she knew that if she had to go somewhere else, one of two things would happen. One is we would have to pay more money for like thing or worse. Her family, her babies would have to down select, which meant moving in with family Yep. Or going somewhere less safe. Yep. She was not going to let that happen. Yep. That is what the idiots in Crash Bros don't understand today. Is people are going to look at their payment, look at their family and go, I have to find a way. We have seen car payments spike. People are deciding their $1,000 car payments aren't worth it with Uber and all these other things. But damn it, mortgage delinquencies are not up. People are going to fight to stay. It's cheaper and it's higher quality. The supply of four sellers is not coming to Matt's point. So Thanks, right. the, the supply of four sellers, the oversupply is not coming from building, right? The, the one metric I haven't seen in that chart that shows how many millions of homes were built per decade is that in the last decade, most of the homes that were built were luxury. 
there wasn't a, a there wasn't a big margin for builders to do entry level homes. So again, yeah. even the lack of supply is hitting where we tend to invest. Mm -hmm. We're not buying the one or two million dollar homes to make them a rental. We're buying the two to three hundred thousand dollar small multifamily to make it a rental. Mm -hmm. So the next metric that we need for this large crash to happen that is happening is a large amount of toxic debt. In 2007, we had 51% of mortgages had an adjustable rate. Um, we got all the way down to 3%. Now it hovers between 8 and 13, whether you listen to Zillow or Redfin. It's somewhere between 8 and 13% of adjustable rate debt. So here's where the toxic debt is. First, sucks to say this, but we're lucky we're in the U.S. Outside the U.S., it's almost 100% toxic debt that readjusts every 3, 5, or 10 years. And I'll ha I have friends in Canada who say, well, no, we have fixed rate debt. It's fixed for 10 years in some cases. Yeah. Well, it's fixed for 10 years. It's not That's 10 years. It's not 30 years fixed rate, fixed to the end of the mortgage. And again, the toxic debt is in commercial. Yes. yes. So large multifamily above five units, uh, com actual commercial for warehouse, for office, for retail. Um, it's not in residential. Yeah, this is actually a conversation that Ken and I had, and he actually put it on Instagram. So he, his team clipped it up and put it on Instagram in one of his stories of him and I talking. The similarities between the commercial lunacy and the residential lunacy of 05, because people talk about the crash in 07, 08, and 09. It was the oh, it was the 05 vintage that was the most toxic. Right? It just took two years for the for the bomb to go off. And uh, we have a lot of people on two-year IO, which stands for interest-only debt. They may have a a, a one-year ad that they could have, but um, this stuff is blowing up right now. It is shocking how similar it is, be, you know, in the commercial market. It is going to be bad. It the the amount of money to be lost is is going to blow you away. It's going to be crazy. But residential, nope, fixed rate. People want to stay, not going anywhere. Commercial. Some yucky number. We're seeing 50% off already. There was a building in San Francisco that uh had debt of like was worth 550 million in 18, 2018. Now we're 240. If you do the math, the owner of that would have to bring 200 million dollars to keep the building. It's called a cash in refi. He's not doing that. He's gonna walk away and mail the freaking check, the keys to the bank saying, Good luck. It's it's gonna be bad. Yeah. So uh, in residential, we, we hear often 90% uh, of mortgages are below 6%, around 60% of mortgages are below 4%, and 23% of mortgages are below 3%. And then we re remember 40% of homes don't have a mortgage. I would like to see that metric in commercial. That's nowhere it's, close. It's zero. So first, it's, <laughs> it's like zero, zero. Right? So first there's it's, right. It, it uh, might the, be it might be sub five percent. I would bet it would be sub five. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Right. And then uh so it's adjustable <laughs> and yeah. and it's more that has mortgages. Uh yeah. so the toxic debt is on commercial, not residential. The other thing we would need, the, the third metric for this housing crash or this real estate crash that's going to happen. So real estate, not housing. Correct. is uh, relaxed lending. People oh. borrowing more than they should, wrapping up 105% of the mortgage to put the closing costs in here. The, here's the closest thing that's happening in residential that I see as an actual threat three to five years from now. Mm -hmm. The 5% down on small multifamily is going to cause a surge in demand for house hackers who aren't going to run the numbers right. right. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to realize that there's two metrics when it comes to, to looking at buying an investment property as a rental. The first is yield. We all focus on yield, but you also have to think of cash flow. Yes. You do, right? You, you, if you run a house hack and you think if all units were rented, here's what it looks like. But what if I'm living in it? Can that person afford that? And can they consistently afford that over the next few years? So lending isn't relaxed. They go forensic. Um, but I'm unfamiliar with DSCR loans, um, asset-based lending, seller financing in some cases. I think some people are setting themselves up for failure with mm -hmm. uh, seller financing. I, I think there's a big threat with subject two right now. Mm -hmm. Subject two makes sense when rates are going down because lenders don't care. They're like, yeah, you keep that five. I'd have to loan it three right now. Yeah. But when you have a three and a subject two and all of a sudden lenders would get a six or an eight, Yes. Calling the loan becomes more attractive to the lender. 
Um, they got to make money somehow. Yeah, Matt, in, in your opinion, with your lending experience, is lending relaxed enough to cause people to have uh, no equity? No, no. I literally just got told, I got told no on a deal this week. Uh, yeah, last week, Thursday. Sorry, lots of days together. <laughs> I got told no, I and I got an original yes when I pitched it. And then we went through it. All the numbers were better than what I pitched. And they said, they changed it. They go, yeah, we're going to pass on this one. I was like, yeah. you don't pass. You're a quarterback. What are you doing? Hmm. They're like, we're passing. But it's like, it's so rare. It's so rare for you to get a no. You should reach out to millennial Mike and say, hey, what's it like when you get a no on a dating app? Because it's probably just as rare. <laughs> but Mike, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the segue. <laughs> um, your opinion, you've been investing like Matt for 20 years. The, the yeah. debt now, is it anywhere near as relaxed as it needs to be? To oh, to, to call what's going on today anywhere close to the 05 stupidity is is to be complete lunacy. That said, you know, if you want to talk about DSCR loans and where we may see fraud today, there's there probably is there. There is some fraud. So where might that be? I think there were a lot of people that chose to go the Airbnb route and got primary fixed mortgages in what should have been an investment loan. That's fraud. Um, so there is some of that. Um DSCR loans are underwritten on the asset and they have equity, but there still could be pain there, right? The equity might be 20%, might be 25. But again, if you take a 40% haircut, that's a loss, but it's nowhere close to the complete lunacy, uh, at least on the residential side. That said, the, the lending, to your point, I mean, think about what lenders were doing in commercial. Let's take a brand new operator whose day job is a computer scientist or computer programmer. They happen to have a high net worth because they, they work for one of the big seven tech companies and they have a lot of stock. And, oh, by the way, they went to some conference and they got badged a multifamily investor. Let's go give them some debt and you know, let's have them raise some money. And there's a great example in Houston, Texas, where somebody bought 3,200 units only to burn $100 million. In 11 months. That's yeah. hard to do. That is hard to do. <laughs> so we're going to see a lot of pain from, it's just like 05 where you were giving people, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if Matt had this happen. It certainly happened to me. I declined tenants as, as uh ten. I declined tenants to move in and then they bought a home. Yes. That is yep. wacky. How That's not yep. supposed to happen, but that did in 05. And I think some, and you're seeing a lot of pain in, in commercial where an operator like this individual in Texas overpaid by 80 million bucks. And the deal was dead the day he closed it. It just took time to blow up. So lots of pain coming in lending in commercial. Yes. And the 80 million that was shaved off came from the LPs. Oh, they lost everything. 100%. And then the last thing I'll wrap up with is, and Matt alluded to this, is a, a massive spike in unemployment can impact people's ability to pay. But let's look at that because this isn't a crash tomorrow. This is a crash in five years. Unemployment, if it doubled, still would be over 90% employed. So if it tripled, we'd start to hit that 90% employment rate. Yes. If that went on for a year, people might not be able to make their payments. Now, you, you talked about People are going to do whatever they can to stay in their house. They'll cancel the internet. They cancel cell phones. They'll have the car be re repossessed because it's more expensive to rent than to own what they currently have. 40% without mortgages, 90% below six, like all the low debt mortgages that we have it's cheaper than renting because rents are going up. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to do that. So they might go into foreclosure, which the average foreclosure takes 1,200 days. So we're adding four years onto the year of unemployment. So yes, a massive spike in unemployment could impact housing in five years. Yeah, I just want to add one more point to that. It's not only the spike in unemployment, it's the spike in unemployment held for a, held for a year. Correct. Right, and that's what a lot of people miss, right? They're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to see unemployment spike to 11%. Well, then the Fed's going to do this, going to do that, and you know, it'll be 6% in three months or whatever it'll be. Okay. And oh, by the way, that 1,200 days that you quoted earlier, Dion, that is without forbearance periods which we already know could be a year by themselves. So we have a spike in unemployment. Banks roll out the forbearance period, which you can ask for up to a year with a freaking mouse click. Then maybe they are forced to sell. So it might be five years before you see all of this come out. But yeah, you're onto something. 
Cool. All righty, folks, that are the four things. So, yes, I would tell you there is a real estate crash coming in commercial, not in housing. I got to jump. Dion, where can people find you? Right here on YouTube, Dion Talk Financial Freedom. And Matt? Uh, later tonight, watching Dion's live stream while holding uh, the baby. For sure. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Guys, you are amazing. Thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate your friendship. Thanks, Mike.